So my name is John Mills. I'm the manager of the Harvard University Asia Center here. That's the host of this uh, seminar today. It's my great pleasure and my honor to be able to introduce my good friend and colleague, Paul Shu. Um, Paul has been uh, a visiting fellow for about two years, a little less than two years at the Asia Center. And during that time, he's had some room to uh, uh, think and uh, to reflect. And the result of that thinking and reflection is his book, which he'll talk about today, Guardians of the Dream. Um, this is a memoir. It's not totally a personal memoir. I read this this past weekend. Um, very interesting, um, entertaining, uh, thoughtful book. And it's not just personal, but it also has a number of sort of uh, professional uh, perspectives as well as political opinions that are expressed in these assertions that are, that are made that I think you may find interesting if you're able to take the time to read it. Um, today is the beginning of a book tour for our author. Uh, he's launching from Harvard, and he will go from here to a number of other cities mm -hmm. to speak about his book. Um, and like other famous people before him, like our, our very senior colleague and friend Ezra Vogel, who says, I travel these days to sell books. So, Ezra <laughs> uh, uh, was about to hit the road so you can sell a lot of books. Um, I think if you read the book, you'll see that uh, Paul is the real thing. Um, that he talks about his experiences of uh, immigrating into the United States nearly 40 years ago uh, from Taiwan, where he was born. Uh, the bumps that he encountered along the way, the efforts that he made, the opportunities that he saw. Uh, he became an entrepreneur, a very successful one. He started a number of enterprises. You could call him a serial entrepreneur in that regard, uh, starting manufacturing and service businesses, uh, providing uh, materials and uh, services for the U.S. government as well as the private sector. Uh, very interested and involved in energy issues these days, both in his research here at the Asia Center and uh, in his uh, business development. But he's, he's done a, a number of things. He's served um, in the private sector, of course, as an entrepreneur. He served in the public sector. He's been appointed to a number of positions in the U.S. government, both in the uh, most recent Bush administration and the Obama administration are often having to do with advising on issues related to uh, entrepreneurship, to immigration. Um, he's won a number of awards from the U.S. government, from the Florida government, where he's based from um, enterprise groups, business groups, and others. Um, he has a PhD uh, in uh, engineering management which has served him very well in what he's done in his uh, business development. And we're very lucky that he's been here this past year, this past couple of years. He's been not only a, an active member of the community when he is here, but he's also a, a, a friendly, wonderful guy to get to know. Too. So it's always, it's always a pleasure to have someone who is a quasi-scholar, a successful businessman, an author, but also a good person. And a nice person to have around. Wow. So we appreciate that very much. So, um, last thing I'd like to say, I have my autograph copy already. <laughs> um, but for anyone who would like an autograph copy after we're done, there are extras here, and he would be happy to sign um. copies of the book for you, if you'd like. So with that, I'd like to turn over the okay. floor to Paul. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, that's, uh, that's one of the best uh, introduction I ever have. So, the yeah, the first one, <laughs> I just, <laughs> but you know, all seriousness, I, I wish, uh, I wish my mother-in-law can hear all that, you know, so <laughs> she probably have a little different opinion about me, you know, so uh, thank you so much, John. Um, yeah, this is my very first stop at my, my, my book tour. Uh, I just can't think about any better place than Harvard Asia Center to start it. Uh, Harvard Asia Center, honestly, will always have a very special place in my heart. Um, I don't think I can come this far with this book without Harvard Asia Center. So, so thank you, Holly. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, John. Thank you, all the colleagues in, at Harvard uh, uh, at Asia Center. You guys not only provide me a, a place for me to, to study, but you also provide me a place to, to make me think. So for all these uh, uh, fellows here, so I, 
I congratulate you for, uh, for opportunity like this because you cannot find any better place in this world to, to think about what you're trying to do the next step other than Harvard Asia Center. So with that, I want to thank you again, Harvard Asia Center. You, you guys really make, make me what I am today. So, well, I'm going to go very quickly about just kind of a brief explanation about the book. And uh, this book really have a special meaning uh, 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 to me because, as you know, I'm the first generation immigrant. Uh, you know, it's just uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is, is very common to all the Americans. But to the first generation immigrant, really have a very, very special meaning uh, to an immigrant like me. So, again, this is, this is my story. Uh, this is my journey. I came over this country almost 40 years ago, and this is how I started. So let me, let me just go through this thing very quickly. Uh, I remember it was 1976, uh, September, one Sunday afternoon. Uh, I got off the bus. It, it looked just like this from Kansas City. And I still remember uh, the bus driver drove, you know, close to the curve, and he cranked the door open and big voice and said, Warrensburg. So I got off the bus. And I have a two small luggages with me. And I was standing there, and I look around, and I saw buildings. And I can tell this is, this is the campus of University of Central Florida. I mean, Missouri. Central Missouri. Central Missouri. Wow. I live in Florida. <laughs> But you know, I have no idea where I'm supposed to go next. And barely speak English, I was really a little nervous. So I saw this guy was walking on the street, so I went over there and I tried to stop him. I said, um, uh, excuse me, uh, I am the new student uh, here. And I don't know how to continue the conversation. So he looked at me, he says, oh, We'll come to Warrensburg. <laughs> so he came walking. <laughs> I said, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I. Anyway, so somehow I managed to, uh, to get to the administration building because I wanted to register. And I realized that's a Sunday afternoon. Nobody working. <laughs> so, and, and I said, where am I going to sleep this the night? Because 30 hours before I left Taipei, I got on the airplane, I flew all the way from Taipei to Los Angeles and changed the airplane from Los Angeles to Kansas City and get on the bus. So that's about 30 some hours ago. I, I was a little tired. And immediately need is to find a place to spend the night. So I managed to get to the Phillips uh, 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 dormitory. <laughs> I walk in and talk to this, uh, what he calls a house mother, the lady who's in charge, the, the, the whole dormitory, and I explained to her, and she was very kind and said, son, sorry, you, you have not registered yet, so your name is not on the list, so you don't have a bed. I said, well, then where am I going to spend the night? She said, well, there's a Holiday Inn uh, right over there across the street. Well, since I only have $500 in my pocket, to spend $20 that night in Holiday Inn, that's close to 5% of what I have, you know. I, I don't think I can afford that. So, so, and she really, she understood. So I spent my first night in this great country of mine on the couch next to the janitorial uh, uh, supply closet. So that's how I, so that, that's how I started, you know, my journey to this great country called United States of America. You know, everybody has some people have some influence in you. Uh, I believe that my mother, my mother really has have some, some influence in me. Oh, this, this cute little guy, that's me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> About 60 years ago, yeah. <laughs> so look at me now. Uh, here we go, yeah. My father was, well, be, between the, um, the occupation of a Japanese in Taiwan, you have to understand a little history about Taiwan. And then when Chiang Kai-shek regime took over Taiwan, so he was kind of in between. So he wasn't very successful in his business. My mother became the breadwinner. Um, 
How to make money? Well, my mother learned how to sew. So I remember all kinds of young kids uh, came to my house and my mother would make the uniform for them. And she bought a, a sewing machine and I, I remember every night, I still can hear that, you know, her feet, you know, you know paddling the, the, the sewing machine and, and she just worked, worked and worked. So we, I was not a very good student at, at, at school because I, I always asking why not. I, I'm not a really <laughs> obey. So I always challenge the authority. Um, so the school says no chewing gum. So I ask why not chewing gum? And they said no, uh, just no chewing gum. Well guess what? I chew gum. <laughs> so the second time I got caught and the teacher was very mad, says you have gum in your mouth, and she demanded me to, to, to spit out. Well, I did spit it out, but I don't know how the gum just kind of hit her face, you know. <laughs> wow, that was a big thing, you know. And uh, so they got my mother to the, to the school and said, just take him home. We, we can't handle him anymore. My mother walked me. That, I was about 11 years old. My, mo 11 or 12. my mother walked me out of the school, and she was very quiet, you know. And I said to myself, my God, I'm going to get it this time. You know? So after a while, she looked at me, and she said, well, this school may not be good for you. Let's find a better school. So no punishment, just kind of a wisdom, you know. That really have a long-lasting impact on me because somebody believed in me and I have no fear anymore. As long as I feel like I'm doing the right thing, I have no fear. And really come to think of it, that's, that's kind of entrepreneurship, you know. So anyway, I I'm enjoy Warrensburg because I can major in uh, industrial management and system engineering for my master's degree. So I was very thrilled. I, I just studied very, very hard, but I always worry about the money. American people are the most generous, most kind people. And I'll give you a quick story about that. The cafeteria opened from Monday to Friday. So I got plenty of food to eat. Not, not very good food, but you know, I'm not hungry, right? But cafeteria closed on, on Saturday and Sunday. Now, I'm telling you this is really a reality now. You know, if you've never gone through that, you never, you probably cannot comprehend. Saturday, I can save enough food. I can, I'll be okay. I'll, I'll have enough to eat. Sunday is tough. So one Sunday afternoon, I, I was hungry. So I walk around, and I, I saw this little hamburger place really hungry so I walk in now before I walk in I, I, I pick up my pocket I, I was counting all the changes I want to make sure how much I have you know so I was counting all the changes and I look at the manual and I said uh, cheeseburger so the man behind the counter says um anything else I say no just cheeseburger says anything to drink um, no just just water so I pay the man and I was sitting there and waiting for my food. After a while, he says, oh, your food's ready. I went there and picked up the food. I found not only just the, the cheeseburger, but I got a bunch of French fries and a big piece of fried chicken. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 this is not, I did not order this. And the man says, it's on the house. That's how I met M Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller and Mrs. Miller, they they're the owner of the, uh, of, the, of the small restaurant in Warrensburg, Missouri. Um, they kind of uh, took me in to their house. So I started knowing their, their, uh, their kids. I become the big brother of all his three little ones. But from that moment, I turned from not belonging because I don't know a, a single soul in the state of Missouri. But now I turn from not belonging to belonging. That's a big, 
kind of a warm and really a fuzzy feeling. Mr. Miller, it's just a big, hard guy. I, in my book, I, I did talk about him. Uh, Saturday, every Saturday afternoon, he will go into the library and look for me and say, Paul, close the book. You need to let your mind ease off a little bit, so come with me. So I would ride with Mr. Miller, you know. Of course, I don't have a car, right? <laughs> so, wow, you know, I see Missouri. I see the countryside. Beautiful. I never have a chance to, to breathe the, 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 the air like that. And I, one day, I, I remember, I said, wow, look at those cows. He says, no, 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 Paul, the, the, we don't call them cow. We call them Angus, you know, the, the black, you know, with a white face. So I got a little notebook, so I wrote down Angus. That's how I learned, you know, English as my second language. So Mr. Miller, very interesting guy. He, he's kind of like a jack of all trade. He, he, owned, he, his wife owned a little restaurant. He also owned a little, uh, uh, little furniture store. He sell used furniture. And then he sell radio uh, 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 advertisement as a part-time job. So one day he says, Paul, why don't you come with me? I'm, 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 I'm making a business call to a new, new uh, a car dealer. I said, OK. So I went with Mr. Miller. And he walked into this Chevrolet color, uh, uh, car dealership, which is the gentleman he never met. So, and then they sit down. And he start talking about fishing. He talking about which lake the fish is better than the other lake, and and the guy uh, apparently he was new in town, so he was very interested, you know. Wow! So he keep nodding his head, and he talk about fishing, and he's talking about the kids baseball game, and talk about that about 10, 15 minutes, and the end, and the guy says, "Yeah, I'll buy 20 minutes for the the, the radio <laughs> time for the next uh, next the next uh, four weeks." So he actually made the sale. So in the car, I said, David, how in the world you know to talk about fishing and talk about baseball? <laughs> he says, that's easy. He says, all you have to do is just look around his wall. You know? And he says, Paul, listen, people only interest to talk about something they're interested in, not what you're interested in. So you need to make sure that people like you. But even before that, you make sure that you are likable. That's the first business advice I ever had. And that advice, I think, make me kind of a, I use the term loosely, successful, but kind of a make me successful for the rest of my life. Because I always want to make sure that I'm a likable and I talk about something that they're interested in. So that's really Mr. Miller. So I, I, uh, we kept contact and everything for the for the last almost thirty years. And he he passed away. Yeah, last year. So I, I really miss him a lot. Okay, speaking of uh, of uh, of this this uh, when I was five. I was seven years old. My mother asked me, what do you want to do when you grew up? I, I told my mother, I want to be a, I want to be a chang zhang. <laughs> chang, Chinese means uh, factory. Zhang means the head. I want to be the head of a factory. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I, I, kid, kids want to be an astronaut, want to be, you know, I just want to be a head of a factory because I always want to use my hands or whatever, you know? So, so when I established my first company called MTI and I finally, it's my childhood dream, is realized because I honestly become a chang zhang. <laughs> so <laughs> I, have, I, have more than, I have more than 900 people working for me and I have 10 US locations and all that and we are, we are probably number two suppliers to Boeing and McDonnell Douglas for all their avionics uh, product. Um, see, uh, so this is, this is the F-18s F, F and this is the F-15s. 
So we have 27 avionics product on the F-18s. We have about 16 uh, products on F-15s. So if, if we disappear, the U.S. Department of Defense will get really nervous, you know, so they, at least they're not going to be able to fly, you know, at least these two, two platforms. Um, I, I just want to point it out. This, this, this little guy is called Relay Module Assembly. Um, when I went to McDonnell Douglas for a conference show, for a vendor's conference show, and I overheard somebody said, well, they have a problem on relay module assembly because on the new F-18 ENF, all the relays, you know, relay is a mechanical switches. Yeah. So all the relays are building in a one big panel. So if that panel get hit by one bullet, then the whole airplane went down. So they will worry about that. You know, it's called, in military, it's called survivability. So I came back home. I wrote the guy a letter, okay? That was even before emails. So I said, you know, I can build, you know, I got an idea. I can build a relay and make it relay assembly like this, a module. And I can make like a 20 of them and just <laughs> skid around everywhere on the airplane. We put one over here, one over here, one over here, one over here, one over here. So if you get hit, it's okay. You, you, the airplane can still come home. And he says, okay, why don't you build me a, a prototype? I said, okay, um, I'll build you a prototype. I said, how many do you need? He says, I'll build me two. I said, okay. Uh, he says, well, then how much? I said, well, let me see, the material, da, da, da. I said, uh, how about uh, $5,000 each? Well, I already overestimate, you know. <laughs> so two, $10,000, right? This is McDonnell Douglas, right? So he's not laughing. He says, ah, you, you don't understand. I said, what? He says, we're McDonnell Douglas. We cannot give a contract for 10000 <laughs> Minimum, 80000 know? I said, whoa, that's a good problem to have, you know? I said, okay, well, why don't I just build you more? <laughs> that's how I started as a first-generation immigrant, okay? I started MTI, and I started a good relationship with McDonnell Douglas, and later on become Boeing. And because of them, we passed the, uh, you know, there are three levels of security clearance. You know, confidential, secret, and top secret. So we started with confidential, <laughs> and then we become secret because we were building the, uh, the laser distance finders over here, you know, and, and, and this, all these radar cable, those are very sophisticated. And, and this is the, uh, the air, air, air data sensing unit, which is mounted on the, uh, on the two side. When you, yeah, this technology actually bought by Boeing, and uh, when you fly seven, uh, 737 uh, or seven, 777, oh, I have nothing to do with the Malaysian now, okay? <laughs> I have no idea, okay? Anyway, so you see the airplane got a little, two little things sticking up, and that's, that's, what, it, that's what this is it, okay? So we actually built this for the F-15s, and they, they explained the things uh, to all our other, other other uh, uh, commercial airplanes. So it, it's quite a run. It's a, uh, that's what I call America. It's really a land of opportunity. Even a first generation immigrants like me don't barely speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I guess because I don't take nothing for granted. I see everything. I, I appreciate this country, what this country provided to me. So I think that's part of the reason why I made it. So. Anyway, um, MTI got acquired by BAE. BAE stands for British Airspace. Um, so they want MTI, so, so they bought it. So I, this was <laughs> happened in 2005. I called David. I know David always, David Miller. I know he always wanted to have a BMW. So I said, David, I want you to go down to the BMW dealership pick up a 740, <laughs> any color you want. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was, uh, that was a quite a, yeah. Anyway, uh, so later on, I, 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 built a, I built a company called TPP and Actigraph and Shooting the Price, I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'm very honored that Ming Lam is sitting right there and, and she's my, uh, my partner in, 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 in China and she's 
hundred percent in charge of the, the, the Chinese operation right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, John mentioned I did get appointed by, uh, by President Bush. Uh, I was in charge of the uh, government contracting and business development in, in Washington for, for close to a year. Um, I was political presidential appointees and and uh, so that was a uh, that was quite a quite an experience. Uh, this is Eileen Chow, uh, the Secretary of Labor. Uh, uh, the the only thing I don't like in D.C. is this con congressional hearing. <laughs> so that's a, that's a really tough. Yeah, that's the only thing I I I I, I don't like. It. So anyway, uh, okay. So anyway, so this is this is the. Uh, yeah, this is the China, uh, Ch uh, China operation. Entrepreneurship, I believe that entrepreneurship is, uh, the secret for entrepreneur spirit is you have to be able to see something kind of invisible. So Ming and I, we realized that in China, the air pollution is a big problem. So because of this, and we try to create something, we provide a solution. So we, we our technology will help to burn the coal much, much more harder, much, as, much higher efficiency. So, so before, you know, uh, they, they, they burn coal at a temperature, let's say about 1200 degree, and we can get it up to like 1500 degree. <coughs> so they actually burn less coal and save the energy and save the air pollution. Air pollution, trust me, it's a really a big, big, big problem in China right now. So, under Ming's leadership, we're, yeah, we, we, are, we are going to, to uh, our, our third operation, right? Yeah, prototype, it's went very successfully so far, so I think this, this, uh, I think this operation will probably gonna, gonna take off in, in a very short, short time. Okay, I'll tell you why I wrote this book. Five years ago, um, I was at the, uh, in San Diego, I, I saw this parade. It says, the American dream is dead. Now, you know, that's just unbelievable to me. I said, my God, how can people say that? This is probably the greatest country in the whole wide world. And you said, American dream is dead? Well, here's, here's the reason, you know. 63% of a college student believe the American dream is dead. And only 39% of the parents that believe that their kids will have a same level of comfortable living like they have. And 68% of Americans, you know, lost the, lost the confidence and integrity of the, of the financial system. And only 30% of the people like their job. You see, our GDP is about 16 trillion. Our GDP is higher than the next four countries' GDP combined. So if you look at from the, uh, from the economic point of view, we are, we are a giant, you know, with all these things. And we're, our technology, we are the leader for, you know, Silicon Valley, and, and you guys all know that. So for the future for, for America, I think it's gonna be great because if we continue to de develop this robotic technology, all these manufacturing, labor manufacturing, all, I believe in five years, all these things are gonna come back to the United States. The reason why China, India, Brazil have a, have advantage on us, because they have a cheap labor. But if a robotic technology get to the point that we don't really need that kind of a cheap labor, all these manufacturing jobs, I believe it's all gonna come back to the United States. And also, why United States? If you're gonna spend that kind of money, investment on robotic technology, you want to put your money in the place that people honor the intellectual property right. And that's why I believe that in the next five years, these, some of these manufacturing jobs is all gonna come back to here. So with that, I believe that <laughs> Here, here, here's the reason. America, I believe, is created as an as a immigrant uh, nation. Um, you know, in the early days, 
people really don't call them immigrants. They call them a uh, uh, traveler, they call them a uh, uh, pilgrim, they call them a uh, uh, settler, but never call them an call them, uh, uh, immigrant. And I think the reason they come here is because they want to make sure that they want to secure something that it even did not exist. By the time the Statue of Liberty was installed in 1886, uh, the face of immigrants start changing. Uh, you see a lot of um, Germans, Irish, Italian. It, it's just, it's not pure, you know, uh, uh, people from England anymore. And uh, I think the reason immigrants will have 30% of them uh, have a tendency to start their own business, again, I believe that because immigrants don't really take anything anything for granted. Uh, as you can see, you know, the company like Intel, some microsystem, Google, eBay, they all created by immigrants. And 80% of the Fortune 500 companies all at least have one immigrant as a, as a co-founder. And, and look at all these, oh, look, at all, uh, look at all these guys, yeah. And they are the they are the, the mover and shaker for, for our economy today. What is people keep asking me, what what is um what is American dream? Um I I really give a lot of thought. Um I I come up with these five different things. Because to me, American dream is a combination of a freedom, ingenuity, integrity, opportunity, and inclusion. And here's why. In many other countries in this world, people view freedom as a principle. Only in America, we treat freedom as our <coughs> core value. Uh, ingenuity. America probably the only country that you can come with nothing, and you become an entrepreneur. And I tell you why. Just name one country in this world other than, than America that a small businessman will go to the bank and want to borrow the money and don't even have a collateral, and the government will say, okay, banker, loan him the money. I, Uncle Sam, I will guarantee 85% of it. So you, the bank, will lower your risk from 100% down to 15%. It's called SBA Guarantee Loan. An organization called Small Business Administration will loan, will loan you, the small entrepreneur, 85% of the cost you need. If you fail, then Uncle Sam will pay for it. Just name one country will do that to help their own people. Integrity, if you never live in overseas or never done business international, I don't think you're gonna have a hard time to really comprehend, to understand the integrity of this country. Yes, we have a lot of crooks, but we have much less crooks than other countries, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Trust me, I've been there, okay? People lied to me looking at right in my eye, and I knew he was lying, he knew he was lying. He lied to me. <laughs> you know, I swear to God. I swear to God. Okay, and that's we at least we don't have that. You know, I think, I think the U.S. You know, our business, our infrastructure really, in many ways, is is based on the common decency. People know what's right, what's wrong. So that's make it America, America. Opportunity, again, you know, $16 trillion, you know, economy. Uh, I, just, I just don't see, you know, people lose hope uh, uh, about, about America. And inclusion, Gallup poll report showed that 150 million people, one in 30 world population, if you give them a chance today, they will move to, to America. They will move to here and live here permanently. That's one in 30. And 85% of Americans said, our community is a good place for immigrants. My God, think about that. 
you know, just name one country in this whole wide world will have that kind of inclusion. I, I, it just, it, it sort of blew my mind when, when I heard that people say American dream is dead. Well, I remember Ronald Reagan once said, you know, you can go to France, you never become a Frenchman. You go to German or it, Italy, you never become a German or Italian. But happen if you come to America, there's a good chance you become American. And here, here's really the, the reason why. And again, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness really have a very, very special meaning to immigrants. Uh, Eleanor Northwell said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And my own people, the Chinese pervert, my own people, Chinese believe that <coughs> you better light a candle than curse the, the darkness. So, uh, again, just in closing, I, 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 want to, I want to thank, I want to thank uh, a couple of very special friends who, who really, you know, uh, 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 wrote some uh, very nice endorsement for me. Uh, Joe Scarborough, uh, the Morning Joe, and Norm Manata, he's the uh, Secretary of, of Transportation and Commerce. Uh, Norm, when he was, he, he's, he's a Japanese American. When he was young, uh, he, he himself, his sister, and his parents, his grandparents, were all sent to concentration camp because that was close to the end of the Second World War II. And just because he's a Japanese American, he become one of the most patriotic Americans I ever know. Secretary Steve, it's a, it's a Cambodian American. Uh, he walked six days nonstop from Cambodia, escaped, escaped to Thailand, and somehow Somehow he, he managed to get to, uh, get to New York. And for the next six years, he drove taxi in New York City and managed that he went to, uh, he went to Columbia University and majored in uh, political science. And then he got a job at a, a State Department and President w, uh, George W. Bush appointed him as ambassador to, to UN only in America, and Bill Kirk, a uh, four-star general, and a patriot American, Ken Rich from, uh, from New York, and my good friend, uh, Bill Overhaul. He's a senior fellow at Harvard Asia Center, and he, he wrote a book, I mean, he, he read a book, just like John, and uh, did you guys change note? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, he wrote me a really nice, uh, in, in nice endorsement. So. Again, this is, this is my story, and this is my book. Um, uh, I'm just very proud that, that I have a chance to write this book, and if you want my autograph, I'd be honored to, to do that. So I, with that, I, I open the floor for, for some questions. If I don't have the answer, uh, Dr. Soong can, can help me to answer <laughs> <that>. So. <laughs>